And I'm going to ask that you would stand, so that you can stretch your legs, because we're not going to sing after this, we're going to go straight into the preaching, um, and that we might together stand as we hear the reading of the Word of God. Let's stand, and we might justify it. of the people and their wives against their Jewish brethren. For there were those who said, We, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore, let us get grain that we may eat and live. There were also some who said, We have mortgaged our lands and vineyards because of the famine. There were also those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax on the lands and vineyards. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children, and indeed we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters. It is not in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and vineyards. And I became very angry when I heard their outcry and these words. After serious thought, I rebuked the nobles and rulers and said to them, each of you is exacting usury from them. So I called a great assembly against them. And I said to them, According to our ability, we have redeemed our Jewish brethren who were sold to the nations. Now indeed, will you even sell your brethren? Or should they be sold to us? Then they were silenced and found nothing. Then I said, What you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies? I also with my brethren, my servants, and lending them money and grain. Please, let us stop this usury. Restore their vineyards, their olive groves and their houses, also a hundredth of the money and the grain, the new wine and the oil that you have charged them. So they said, we will restore it. And we will require nothing from them, we will do as you say. Then I called the priests and do according to this promise. Then I shook out the fold of my garment and said, So may God shake out each man from his house and from his property who does not perform this promise. Even thus may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen, and praise the Lord. Promise. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year until the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the governor's provisions. But the former governors who were before me laid burdens on the people and shekels of silver. Yes, even their servants bore rule over the people. But I did not do so because of the fear of God. Indeed, I also continued the work on this wall and we did not buy any land. All my servants were gathered there for the work. And at my table was, besides those who came to us from the nations around us, now that which was prepared daily was one ox and six choice sheep, also fowl were prepared for me, and once every ten days in abundance of all kinds of wine. Yet in spite of this, I did not demand the governor's provision on this people. Remember me, my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. Let's pray together and ask God to help us. Father, we thank you for your holy scriptures. We recognise they come by the inspiration of the Spirit of God. They are the very out-breathing of your mouth. We pray that you would give us hearts to believe them, to embrace them, to receive them to ourselves as you have given them. We thank you that we can trust what you have written. And is living, it's active. And Lord, it will endure forever. And we pray that you would bless, Lord, this portion to our understanding this morning, that we may indeed be moulded by even your scriptures to be the people that you call us to be. We ask in Jesus' name. Well, we return this morning to our series from the book of Nehemiah, what we've broadly entitled Building for God. And though the, the events 
in 2,460 years ago from today. Nevertheless, what we read in the book of Nehemiah is not just a historical book, it's not just the personal part, journal of Nehemiah, it is a portion of the living word of God and there to us in our day about our involvement in building the walls of Zion, that is building up Christ's church in this world and even in this place. And so as we come to the book of Nehemiah, it's been several weeks since we've been here, so let me remind you, but it's in many ways the character of Nehemiah and his role, his leadership in building the walls. But this is not just about Nehemiah's responsibility of building. This is about my responsibility. This is about your responsibility as a Christian to have a full dedication of God, the, 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 the work of our Lord in this world. I remind you, way back in our first study from chapter 1, when, when Nehemiah hears and gets news of the condition of the walls in Jerusalem. Remember where he was? He was a long way away in Shushan. News of what it was like, it, it actually revealed to us as we looked at chapter 1, something of the state or the, the heart of that man, that he had a heart for the cause of God in this world. Nehemiah was a cupbearer, remember? And yet his primary concern was not his own in the emperor's court. He was not a man who was caught up with his daily hassles or his palace concerns, his hiccups or personal hang-ups and no doubt as a cupbearer he had all of those potential things looming before him every day. Not that, his priority was for God's kingdom in this world and that's what we see unfold here. He saw that the thing that was at stake with the walls was not real estate was not architecture and ultimately it was not the building project. The thing that was at stake was the honour of God and that's the thing that moved him. And so what does Nehemiah do? Remember, Nehemiah firstly prays. And in the midst of that prayer we also saw Nehemiah doesn't just pray, Nehemiah plans, he diligently thinks and plans. Nehemiah risks everything in order to do what he could himself in the work of God, like every faithful worker in God's service. Ever since, and even before, Nehemiah found himself, when he gets to Jerusalem, when he's on street level, when he's getting into the task of rebuilding with the people, he soon encountered opposition to the work. That's what every faithful servant will and does encounter. Surrounded by enemies. And they were people who did not want the rebuilding work to occur. And we're seeing that is something there that's beyond just the physical, beyond just the, the flesh and blood, beyond just the personalities. We've seen that there's, there was someone else behind the scenes at work, that Satan will do all that he can, that the enemy of our souls will use all types of opposition as he does here. He will use threats, he will use ridicule, he will use criticisms, he will use intimidation, he will use gossip, he will use all those things as he sought to do with Nehemiah in the early chapters. Yet so far as to go to rebuilding this completed task has had a danger which we touched on. They're about halfway. They're, they're pretty well got the thing joined up around the wall but they're only about halfway high. And there is such a, a long way to see this task completed and so they were in danger of becoming weary, they were in danger of becoming discouraged and that's threatened by the people. And of course Satan loves to stir up thoughts of doubt, thoughts of discouragement to, to to slow the pace of the work. And we've also seen, as we saw in a previous study, that Satan will even use the accumulation of rubbish from the past that will hinder the work of today and potentially hold... They are some of the things that we've we've noticed. I just remind you of that. It's been about a month since we've been here. Some of the things that Nehemiah encountered. And yet, remember the scene that we last saw when we were last in Jerusalem through this passage... When we last saw Nehemiah, he's maintaining the posture of prayer. He's pointing to people, encouraging them to continue to persevere in this good work. And there the people were. Remember that scene. They're diligently at work. In one hand's a sword and in the other hand's a trowel. And the building work continues. 
So as we come now to chapter 5 today, we see a new... And, and this morning we'll see what lay behind that crisis and indeed what lays at the foundation of Nehemiah overcoming this challenge. And in summary, it's what I believe is encaptured in what I've tried to give by way of the title this morning, Building with Godly. Just to, to open up, break open this passage just under two major headings, we'll look at the great outcry in the first few verses and then secondly, scoop the rest of the chapter together under the major heading, the godly reply. Firstly, the great outcry. Look at verse 1. And there was a great outcry of the people, their wives, against their Jewish brethren. I want you to see with me where this was. Previously, remember, Satan attempted to hinder the work via opposition. Now Satan's tactic is more subtle and yet it is one which is often more effective. Opposition that comes from inside the wall. And so verse 1 tells us there was a rumbling inside the camp. There were complaints coming about the people. See that in verse 1. There was a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brethren. You see, if Satan can't achieve his aim of stopping the work of God through outside hindrances, he turns to stirring up trouble in God's people. And their complaint was, according to verse 1, against, not Nehemiah, against their Jewish brethren. It is the case, is it not, that all wars, all human conflicts, all national wars in history, but if you are a student of the history of wars, you will know that it's actually civil war that is the most divisive and it is the most devastating to a people. New Testament records clear statements that highlight really this same danger for God said in the Gospels and we read it only a couple of weeks ago in our Mark reading, if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. The Apostle Paul warned the Ephesian elders that men would rise up from within the church who would say things calculated to draw people away from fault to them. Remember Jude. Jude says that men have crept into the church unnoticed. And, and he goes on to describe how through their lives they had, had, they had a devastating effect upon the people of God. And to illustrate that, you know where he goes. He goes to Old Testament. And so what Nehemiah faces here is an ancient and often a successful tactic of the evil one. It may take on various forms. But there is nevertheless this reoccurring outcry which is designed by the evil one to halt the work of God that he has given for us to do to get on with the task of building the walls of Zion. Introduced to us in verse 1 in chapter 5, this great outcry from the people. It's about the people. It's by the people. It's to one another in amongst the people and that very outcry threatened the ongoing work. So what were the issues then that were leading to this great outcry here in chapter 5? Well, let's, again, how he introduces this in verse 1. And there was a great outcry of the people, it says more than that, and their wives against their Jewish brethren. Now that is fascinating. And I I could get into trouble by saying the wrong thing here, but we should be honest. The Bible mentions women. He mentions women. Nehemiah mentions their wives as those singled out as some of those who are most vocal in expressing their outcry. That's what the text says. Can't hide from it. Now, what's this about? Well, maybe on such a very earthy level. Women who were at home trying to prepare meals every day to feed the hungry mouths of their families and especially their men who are out working on the wall all day. You just try and imagine the scene of what's been going on now, maybe only just for a number of weeks, but it's beginning to bite. It's beginning to impact families. It's beginning to impact women and husband. I mean, it's well and good that you go out every day and you go to work on that wall, but I've got a question for you. What are we going to eat? Are you going to bring home a brick at the end of the day for me to fry up for your meal tonight? 
I mean, what are you expecting, husband? Kentucky, what am I going to use? Double beef, cement burger, Christian bricks. I mean, where's the food going to come from? You've given all your efforts to working out on the wall. You see, for many people engaged in the work of rebuilding the walls, and I think this is the point, there was a financial restraint. And there are three groups mentioned in the next few verses. There's a group in verse 2 who express their outcry. There's a group in verse 3 who expresses their outcry. And there's a group in verse 4 and 5 who express their outcry. Look at verse 2. Listen to There were those who said, We, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore, let us get grain that we may eat and live. And so it seems that these were families who may have owned no land, and yet due to their working on the wall, their ability to earn is reduced. They're working long hours. We've seen that previously. Uh, there's, there's, ex, there's extra demand on them because of the threat of the external opposition that we've looked at in previous studies. And as verse 2 tells us, these families had many mouths to feed at home. Look at verse, we have mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses that we might buy grain because of the famine. And so here is this group who have, who have gone into debt. They've mortgaged their farms, they've mortgaged their properties in order, it seems, to get food and their particular dilemma, their security, if they could not pay their debts, and they're hoping for this potential income to come with the upcoming harvest, but due to the poor season, that did not look promising. Verse 4, we had the third group. There was also those who said, we have borrowed money for the cans and vineyards. And so here there are these people who have used their farms as collateral to borrow money in order to pay the exorbitant taxes that the Persian Empire had imposed upon them. You know, as we've already seen this really, may have been lenient toward all their subjects when it comes to the various religions. But when it comes to levies, taxes, levies on lands, the, the Persians had a reputation of subjects. And so we see this group are feeling the pressure, the pinch, and, and they're forced to... to have their children go off and work for their creditors in order to pay off the debt that was owed. And so it says in verse 5, yet now our flesh is the flesh of our brethren, our children is their children, and, and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have been brought into slavery. It's not in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and Vineyards. Our hands are tied by these cruel creditors. A cry comes from by the people that it's against their own people. And so, in other words, those who are lending their money at it seems high interest were their fellow Jews. And so, it's like the cashed up Jewish citizens will rip off their fellow Jews. Of course, you think of it from their point of view, this was an ideal time to make a quick buck. This is an ideal time to line their own pockets. And yet, whatever outward impression these people were giving of their commitment to the work of rebuilding the walls, the reality of that particular task, their focus, these people, was not God's kingdom at all. Their focus was their own little kingdom, their own little empire, not God's. And again, I remind you who they were according to verse 1 as our introductory statement. They are works, outcries against their the words. Now, these are no doubt some of the very same people who initially, when that building work first began, they threw their lot in with the rest. Back in chapter 2, verse 18, these are part of the, the, the broader group who together had said in chapter 2, verse 18, let us rise up, come on, and build the wall. But the first flush of enthusiasm has passed. And now their true desires, where they really are at, begins to come to the surface. 
That is, they are more interested in their own little worlds, influencing others than they were in... What are they doing? Well, these people are using their financial status to gain advantage. They're trying to gain benefit over others or from others because of their own situation. It's a form of greed, no doubt. It's a form of manipulation, no doubt. Threatening the very existence of the work of God. And so as we step back from this, we could say that, sure, at one level, the economic infrastructure of the province of Judah was clearly in danger. There are some economic problems in this society. In this passage is something far more serious than the local Judean economic policy. That is, the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. There's something happening here. There's something that is a burden to Nehemiah. That is, that's, that's a burden. But there's something far deeper that's a burden to him. You see, public policy or stable government, so that is important. Remember who Nehemiah is according to chapter 1. He is a man whose heart is for God's cause. You know, it is possible for Christians today to get so distracted with all the comings and goings of the world today caught up with the public policy uh, interactions or the economic strategies and all of those debates that go on for Christians to get so caught up in that and lose sight of why we are actually on the planet as Christians. First, in what the answers are to all the political problems in our world today and yet at the same time they fail to be committed and deeply dedicated to the greater work, to the work of building for God and his kingdom in this world. Well, we see Nehemiah is not indifferent to the economic higher priority. He he identifies something in these coming verses that is far more foundational, that is, if you like, the thing that underlies this problem, the thing that is at the foundation or the footing of the great outcry and hence the conflict. People inside the wall, not treating each other as they should, and that's clearly a major problem. And he identifies that it's causing the nations around to ridicule in the coming verses. But Nehemiah needed to expose what was the fundamental cause of this as the outcry between the people. So what is that issue? Where did the trouble ultimately lie? Well, I believe he tells us in verse 9. You just jump ahead there. He said, then I said, what you are doing is not good. Okay, well we can work that out. Morally it's a bad thing, it's wrong. And then he said, not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies. See what he's saying there. Should you not walk in the fear of God? In other words, you have not been walking in the fear of God. Should you not be walking? So Nehemiah, I believe, identifies the ultimate cause behind the great outcry. There are many of these people who, though they were part of the broader group of the people of God, they actually truly lack a a right perspective when it comes to the fear of God. By pointing the finger at someone else, which of course always means you've got three coming back at yourself, doesn't it? The ultimate cause of their conflict was not outside of themselves. This is what he's identifying. The ultimate cause of their conflict was inside them. James teaches us in James chapter 4 when he asks the questions, where do wars and where do conflicts, where do fights come from? And he answers that question with another question which is an implied clear answer. He says, they come, those conflicts, those wars, come from your desires for in your members. And so what he's saying there is any conflict in a marriage, any conflict in a family, any conflict between Christians, any conflict in a community, any conflict between nations, that conflict comes not because of the other person or the other group of people. It's not outside of ourselves, it's from within. 
And here you see Nehemiah is identifying the ultimate cause of the outcry about the people. It was a lack of godly. The one who has a true sense of godly fear is the person who says, I have been made by God and I have been made for God. I understand that God's eye is all that there is coming a day that I will give an account to or before this very God. This this majestic, this awesome God, which we heard a little bit about last week, this this is the God I reverence. This is the God I I awe, love. This is the God I want to please in all of my life. I desire to live for his cause. I desire to live for his glory. Well, these people were living for themselves. They were living for what they could gain. They were not living for God, not living for his work. This led then to this outcry by the people about the people. Secondly, let's move forward and we see this fear of God theme is again repeated in the second half or the second portion of the chapter. Let's look now secondly at the godly reply. Verse 6. I became very angry when I heard their outcry and these words. He's only been in town a couple of weeks. He's still getting a feel for what's going on. As a godly man, Nehemiah's heart was stirred when he came to understand the conduct, the attitude. In verse 7, the New King James says, after serious thought. Now, literally in the Hebrew, that, that could simply be, I took counsel with myself. In other words, Nehemiah spent time mulling over this whole thing. And so it goes on to say in verse 7, after I'd taken counsel with rulers and rulers and said to them, each of you is exacting usury from his brother. So I called a great assembly against them and said to them, according to our ability, we have redeemed our Jewish brethren who were sold to the nations or the Gentiles. Now we even sell your brethren or should, we, uh, should they be sold to, to, to us? What Nehemiah is saying there in verse 8 in particular is as far as possible we have brought back sold to the Gentiles. That's what we've done as much as we could. But what are you doing now? Think what you're doing now. You're engaging actually in that same practice and you're doing it to yourselves. You're doing it to one of your own. You're doing it to your own brethren. And the question is, what, what's the reply in the end of verse 8? Then they were silent and found nothing to say. You see, in their guilt, they were speechless. They were silent. They were caught out. They were exposed. They were where I want to put it. Then I said in verse 9, what, are you, what you are doing is, should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nations, our Enemies, the world is watching us and they know that that type of conduct brings shame on the name of Jehovah. Now verse 10 is, is a hard verse in Hebrew that, that are hard to understand in the English here but one thing is sure, Nehemiah took responsibility for any part he may have inadvertently played in this situation and though I don't think his words here mean that he had done the things that these lone sharks, if we call them, had been doing. Nevertheless, he does say, with my brethren and my servants, am lending them money and grain. Please let us stop this usury. Perhaps he is simply saying, God is my witness. Yes, I have given of my stuff for them, but I, I, I haven't done the, ro- the, the wrong thing. I've done the right fear. But in terms of this which you have been doing, or us as it were, as a people in broad, stop it. He says, stop acting in a way that is injuring your brethren and halting the work of rebuilding. Change direction. Nehemiah says in verse 11, restore now to them even this day. Their vineyards, their olive groves, their houses, also a hundredth of the money and the grain, the new wine, the oil that you have 
charged them and so they said we will restore it and will require nothing from them. We will do as you say. Fine. We will do as you say. And yet we agree. Well, that sounds good. But Nehemiah knew the tendency of the human heart. He knew that it's so easy to say, you're going to do something. And then not do it. And so what do we read in the second half of verse 12? I call, I call the priests to come in and I require an oath from them, not from the priests, but from those that he, he, he had before him, these who had violated these things. I required an oath from them that they would do according to this promise. Nehemiah called a binding agreement that you're going to do what you said you're going to do. I'm going to help you lock yourself in so that you be true to what you say. That they help you to be people of your word. And so I bring in the priest to help you establish this as a pattern. You see, it is a to be men and women of our word. It seems to me this is, and you've noticed this no doubt, this is one of the things that we see decaying in our culture. People aren't their word anymore, the handshake, the agreement, or just saying I agree to something. People renege on those things. Man or a woman walking in godly fear to do what they said they would do. Turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm number 15 because it does come out clearly in this part of God's word. Psalm number 15. Heating up in here. Okay, yeah, maybe some of the windows just a little bit. Let's read Psalm number 15. You'll see why it's so relevant. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue nor does evil to his neighbour, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend. Now, he doesn't listen to those in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honours those who fear the Lord, He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. He who does not put out his money at usury, nor does he take a bribe against the giving, shall never be moved. And it's particularly at the end of verse 4, I draw your attention to that when the godly say that they will do something, they do it. It's part of walking in the fear of God, even if it means it'll be to your loss, it'll be to your hurt. In Isaiah chapter 11, we have a wonderful passage about the Messiah. He's going to come from the root of Jesse. He's going to be filled with the Spirit. And it says in verse 3, the Messiah is the one who delights in the fear of the Lord. Think of our Lord Jesus. He did walk in godly fear. Now, before he came to the earth, did he not agree to do something? You can start Did he not agree with his father that he would come to earth in order to pay the price for our redemption? And he who walked in godly fear, who delighted in the fear of the Lord, he kept his end of the bargain if he would and he did it even at great cost and hurt to himself. You think, where would you be, Christian, if Christ didn't go through with what he And so, do you see the point? This agreeing to do something, it is an aspect of godly fear and it shows itself in practical ways every day of our lives, or at least it ought to. If we agree to meet someone for coffee, yeah, seems like such an insignificant thing at a certain place at a certain time. Well, it matters that we show up. It matters that we show up on time. We agreed. It matters. It's binding. 
it's, this, this, this touches young people. You, you sign up for the soccer team for the season? You don't just turn up for the first game. You turn up every game you can for the season. And you become a member in the church. See, those who walk in godly fear do what they say. And so here Nehemiah is conscious of what so easily can not be the case. And so what does he do? He, in a sense, back here in Nehemiah chapter 5, he binds these guys to their promise with witness. And then Nehemiah does something very dramatic in verse 13. So come back to Nehemiah 5 verse 13. What's he do? Then I shook out the fold of my garment. So, okay, drama. He dramatised, explained it, he declared it as a curse. So may God shake out each man from his house and from his property who does not perform this promise, even thus may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said Amen and praised God. A bit odd to us. Well, in those days, people kept some personal items in the folds of their garments. We may look, use a common term. We've got pockets. Okay? We put things in our pockets. We put keys in our pockets. We put handkerchiefs in our pockets. We, we put lollies in our pockets. We've got things in his pocket. He's got things in the fold of his garment and, and, and he shakes it out. He, he empties out his pockets before the people. He's shaking everything out. It's dramatic. It's a curse. It's a dramatised curse. If these people, they would be shaken out. He goes on to say about how God will shake them out. They'll have nothing left. Like you've got nothing left in your pockets when you shake it out. In this closing section of the chapter, Nehemiah, what Nehemiah does is he draws a contrast, I believe, between his conduct by the grace of God with that of many of these people that we saw in the first part of the chapter. We've seen that already, remember. The people who do not walk in the fear of God, they become self-centred. People who do not walk in the fear of God become manipulative. People who do not walk in the fear of God become thoughtless of others, building up their own little kingdom. People who are not walking in the fear of God, they may have an outward profession that they follow Jehovah, they may even be outward workers on the wall, but their hearts are not in the work. Their hearts are in something else. That's what we've seen. Well, Nehemiah presents himself with a clear conscience, but over the long haul, over many years, he's able to, to describe from verse 14 and following what he has been. And so it's probably inserted, as it were, back into his uh, journal here. Who was Nehemiah in terms of the community? Well, he was that he was the appointed governor. The duly appointed governor, if you like, had a political role that's been put there over the province of Judah. And in that role as the governor, he was entitled to certain resources, abilities, not just to those people underneath him, but even more broadly within the Persian Empire. And and some of that included hosting, visiting dignitaries who would come from other provinces. And that's hinted at in verse 17 toward the end. And he also had those who came to us from the nations around us. It was common for men in the role of the governor in that sort of position to add additional tax burdens upon the people to gain a little bit extra to help cover their costs of their so-called and the contract. Actually, we see a wonderful positive example of what it actually means on street level to be building with godly fear. Verse 14, where he states that he's been the governor For those 12 years, it says at the end, neither I nor my brothers ate the governor's provisions. It's the contrast. Those who were my predecessors, those before me, laid burdens on the people and took from them bread and wine besides 40 shekels of silver. Yes, even their servants bore rule over the people. But I did not do so because of fear of God. He identifies clearly 
why it was he didn't do what others did. And here is his example. He walked in the fear of God. He built with godly fear. And that godly fear in these last few verses shows itself in several glories. Show you them quickly three things. It prevented sin. It prevented sin, godly fear. Here he is. He comes into office. He's not the first one that's been a governor in that place. He actually gets behind the desk that someone else has sat behind before, previously. There were precedents that were set in how you do that job by his predecessors. And those predecessors, the former governors, had laid heavy burdens on the people. He says that. Nehemiah couldn't do that. He got to um, receive from the people. He was there to serve the people. He, he was not there to gain from the people. He was there, as it were, to give for the people. He'd gone there to help God's work, not establish his own little empire. And so here we see this. No doubt he had political pressure on him. I mean, you think about this just in our world. Political precedence almost becomes law, doesn't it? It's like a justification. Well, I can do this because the former Premier did this or our government can do this because that other government over there does that and who? And that's a political thing that often happens. Well, this, this is no doubt a pressure that he could have felt. He could have felt some sense of, well, I can do this because others have done it. But he wasn't there to gain for himself. Again, I draw your attention to what he says at the end of he had his conduct. He wasn't political, it wasn't about that, it wasn't about that at all. He says, I didn't do so. I didn't do what others did. I didn't conform to the pattern. I didn't bow to the pressure because of the fear of God. You can see, to walk in the fear of God is to walk in the path of holiness. It is to build with godly fear in a way that will prevent sin. It's not about self, it's not about me, it's about the other. It's not about what I can gain for myself, what I can rip other people off to get for myself. It's about what I can give for others. Number two, it prompted service. And you see this in verse 16. Indeed, <clears throat> I also continued the work on this wall and we did not buy any land. All my servants were gathered there. For the see this, his godly fear prompted faithful, diligent service to the Lord. God had called this man to be in this place to serve. He'd come to this place to build whatever else others would be doing or it may not even be seen or known to him. He could say with Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so none of the tensions, none of the problem people is going to halt Nehemiah from the task that God has given him. He's continued the work. There on the wall, so did all my servants. As for me and my house, whatever else anybody else does, I don't know, but we're going to serve the Lord. What a wonderful perspective. Can you say that? That is an understanding of who he is and therefore an understanding of who you are and with an understanding of why you were made and why you are on this planet. That you want to please the Lord? You want to glorify God? You see, a truly godly fear prompts faithful, diligent service, whatever others might do. I don't know. In a sense, it makes no difference. Because the one who fears the Lord, the one who understands God brought me to this place, I will continue to work on the wall. Verse 17 and 19, it produced sacrifice. At my table were 150 Jews and rulers beside those who came to us from the nation. Now that which was prepared daily was one ox, six choice sheep, also fowl, were prepared for me once every ten days, abundance of all kinds. I did not demand the governor's provision. 
because the bondage was heavy on his people. Those walking with godly fear have a generous spirit. They have a heart of willing sacrifice. You see Nehemiah's deep 18. He couldn't do this other thing. The people were burdened. Godly fear produced sacrifice, therefore, in his heart. He sacrificed much for the benefit of the people, things that he could have got away with and so called justified as legitimate, his entitlement in his role. And so he inserts in closing a little prayer in verse 19. Remember me, my God. Remember me for good according to all that I have done for this people. Nehemiah's eye was on the Lord and Nehemiah was on him. He worked for God's glory. His conduct as recorded here was done not for human recognition and acclamation. He's not <laughs> calling the people to pay attention to what he's done. He's calling for God to pay attention to what he has done. Of course God does not. And yet we see his heart for the Lord. Whatever else others might do, I don't know. Why they may do it, I don't know. I don't know their hearts. But this much I know. I have sought to do this for God's cause. I have sought to do this for the glory of God. I have sought to do this for the benefit of God's people. Other people accuse me or criticise me. But what's he saying? Remember me. In other words, Father, you know. Sometimes it's helpful for us to say that. Father knows. Father knows. What a wonderful example we have placed here before us of godly fear. It prevented sin, it prompted service and it produced sacrifice. And yet, as wonderful as all of that is, I don't believe that's where we should stop. To some degree, to point us to someone else, but not not alone, Nehemiah. It's here to point us to the Lord Jesus Christ Someone who is far greater than the governor in Judah. The one who is the governor. Isaiah chapter 11, there shall come one from the root of Jesse. The stem of Jesse. Who is it? The Lord Jesus. His delight, verse 3, is in the fear of the Lord. Our Lord Jesus lived his life conscious of the will of his Father. He was moved with godly fear. He he kept his end of the deal in the covenant of grace right to the very end. Hebrews tells us that even as he prayed with tears, with godly fear, He could say in John 6, all that the Father has given me, I shall lose none of them. He kept his word. He did what he said he would come to earth to do. His delight was in the fear of the Lord. And how did that show itself? Well, it shows itself in these three ways. We see at the end of Nehemiah chapter 5. Prevented him from sin. He learned obedience even unto death. He lived the spine as the sinless sacrifice or substitute for us. His delight in godly fear prompted service, did it not? And what service did he render in his life, in his death? He did it for his God. He did it regardless of how others might have conducted themselves, even those close to him who fell around him right toward the end. Jesus faithfully served right to the end. A man who is described in the scriptures, who calls himself the Son of Man, did not come come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And that godly fear produced sacrifice. The ultimate full sacrifice of himself. For whose benefit? For our benefit. The good shepherd gives his life 
footage here. So friends, as we rise from Nehemiah chapter 5 and from this exposition this morning, can you see we're brought to the table of remembrance, which is where we're going now. The season of joyful, not of Nehemiah, but of the governor of the universe, the Lord Jesus Christ, the sinless one, prompted to serve and produce sacrifice, he who delighted in the fear of the Lord. Amen and may God. Let's pray together. Oh, our God, we thank you. Your holy scriptures are so rich in them. We find perhaps some surprising jewels, but above all, we thank you. They are the very things that we need as we come into your words to be taken again back to the Lord Jesus. We thank you for all that he did, conscious of his conscious of obeying you, pleasing you, and that he could say right at the end that I have finished, I have completed your will. I have glorified your name. We pray, our God, that as we come now to the table to remember all that that was by way of a cost for him, for you would help us as we meditate with joy and gladness and yet with a sense of reverence and awe as well. In these things we pray in Jesus' name.